Welcome in, Fresh Off Vacation, episode 172, What's Right with Nick Wright. And before we pan out and show who our special guest is today, let me tell you about how this podcast usually works. We have done 172 episodes plus the entirety of our top 50 players of all time countdown, so we're at around 200 episodes. There has been one person that is not either a blood relative or my wife, who's an essential blood relative, at, on this show, Lil Wayne. And so we kind of decided we don't, we're not really going to do guests. We're not a podcast that does guests. However, if it is a family-only podcast, there is one person who you all know who is in the sports media space who just newly became able to do whatever he wants in the sports media space, who, while is not a blood relative, I've known for now 10 years. He is my youngest child's favorite person in the world. He is essentially family, and he joins us today on a special appearance. He is, of course, Bomani Jones. Bomani Jones joining us on the pod. Good to see you, Bo. Good to see you, man. I'm not going to lie. When you started saying that everybody had been blood, I thought you were going to say that they had been bloods. No, and then, and, and then you said Lil Wayne, and I was like, I could be, you know. Like, oh yeah, that been the, but, you know what? So that's what it was. Either blood relative or blood. <laughs> blood. And, you know, that's how the podcast has worked so far. So today, you today's show, we're just gonna run through. Uh, we'll spend the first segment talking the NBA, the second segment talking the NFL, and the third segment, as we always do, get to your listener questions. Bomani, how have you been? Good to see you. Doing good. I'm not going to lie. I was, like, actually prepared to come here and just read you your questions. You know okay. what I'm saying? Sorry to job. I can humble, I can humble myself, generally oh. speaking. <laughs> oh, you know? <laughs> that, you know what? When people hear <laughs> Bomani Jones, I think the first thing they think is humble gentleman. Yeah. I think that's one of the first uh, word association things. <laughs> but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do this kind of more like your pod where we just throw things out there. And by the way, subscribe to The Right Time with Bomani Jones. That is still not only in existence, but that is now property of Bomani Jones. And we'll follow him wherever Bomani Jones goes, if I may say so. I hope I was allowed to say No, that. no, you can't. In fact, not only are you allowed to say so, it is almost imperative okay. for me to remind people. Like, no, nah, the pod still exists. Like, they don't understand how that works, and I don't blame them. I still got it. It's coming back in a few. Right. I'll so, let you know. So subscribe to the podcast, The Right Time with Bomani Jones. That is still ongoing as Bomani, you know, navigates the, the next few months and what the space will look like for him. We are going to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart to start with, which is ranking NBA players. <laughs> so Steph Curry was asked by Gilbert Arenas who the greatest point guard of all time is, and he understandably immediately said me himself Steph Curry and then if you watch the longer clip he did 90 second tribute to Magic Johnson it was because he says me he says Steph's the best and then kind of laughs and if you just watch it there it seems like he's being disrespectful he is not but he advocates for himself so here's where I am in a pickle Bo I believe both of these things to be true and this is where I want your take I believe in the marrow of my bones, the greatest point guard of all time is Magic Johnson. And at present, it is not particularly close. I say at present because Steph is still playing and he, you know, see what he does, how long he extends this extended prime. But I believe that is currently written in stone. I also believe this. Almost every time I am asked to do one of those exercises of Create the best five-man team possible. I choose Steph over Magic. That I when, can see it. When, whenever we are talking about, like, all right, Jordan's your two, LeBron's your three, you know, Kareem or Akeem or Shaq are your five. It's like, all right, pick your point guard. I'm like, all right, so Magic's better, but this team is better with Steph. And so that's, those two things seem in conflict, but I believe Magic is the best point guard ever. I believe Steph is the point guard you would most want on almost any team ever. Where are you staying? All right, so where that Steph thing comes up to me is that now that we are in an era where a team that doesn't shoot a lot of threes shoots 20-something a game, Steph Curry looks a lot better, right? Like, in in the game as it currently exists, it can be hard in your mind to think about how you put magic into it and you think about Steph as floor spacer, and so you think of him as better player on that team. Here's the wild thing about Magic that people lose sight of. 
he was actually held back for like five years because he was playing two guard until they got around to trading uh, Norm Nixon away from Byron sure. Scott, right? Yep. He averaged a borderline triple-double, I want to say, in year two, which is like 19, nine and a half, and nine and a half or something like that, playing two guard. Yes. They went to the finals nine times in 12 years, and after not playing basketball for five years, Magic came back and averaged, I want to call it, I've 15, it. 6, and 7. Well, and it is, listen, he missed four full years, and in his first Game back at 36 years old, overweight, Magic, what he did in that first game back. I, I've got it right here. Uh, My apologies. I said I have it right here, but I don't. Yeah, I do. First game back, he goes 19, 8, and 10. In the first two games of the playoffs that year, averaged 23, 10, and 4 against the defending champion Rockets. I and So, Magic's – here's the other thing. It You brought up the beginning of the career. You also have to recognize Magic essentially had a career-ending injury. Yes. We don't look at it that way because it was HIV, but Magic played 12 seasons pre-HIV. Those 12 seasons, Magic Johnson, nine times first-team <laughs> All-NBA, nine times first, second, or third in MVP voting, nine times in the NBA Finals. So 75% of Magic seasons. He was first team all NBA, 75% he was top 3 MVP, 75% he was in the NBA finals. Hey, Steph, as great as Steph is, Steph has been first team all NBA 4 times. Steph has been top 3 MVP voting 3 times. Like there is there is a level to and the fact that Magic the last game he played pre HIV was the finals against Jordan. It's not... Now, was he still peak Apex Magic? No, but he was two years removed from an MVP. One year. One year removed from league MVP, correct. And had just led a team to the finals. So the he was still going a, as a top five player in the league. I feel like Magic gets a little overlooked. or I don't want to say overlooked because he's Magic Johnson. But I do. I am now starting to get to the age... Where and this happens with Akeem a lot too, where people act as if Akeem's career started in the finals in the nineties. Right. That was a post prime Akeem Olajuwon. He was no longer at his apex. Now he was still the best player in the league those years, but like Akeem in year two is in the finals or year three in the finals, putting up thirty in, in year three is in the playoffs, averaging thirty seven a game. Like so there's some some of the 80s stuff gets glossed over. So I think Magic's the best ever. What do you do you think there is a path for Steph in your mind becoming the best ever? I mean, the path would be if Steph Curry winds up with five championships like Magic Johnson had five championships, right? Sure. Then all of a sudden we're having a bit of a different discussion. Like you and I have talked about this with the Steph LeBron thing. It gets weird if he gets to five and LeBron does not, right? I still think LeBron's a better player. It just becomes harder to talk to people about it. Sure. The thing that I think gets lost, though, about Elijah Wan in the 80s, and it's the thing, same thing with Magic in those in the late 80s, early 90s. Elijah Wan was carrying bombs, man. Like, after 86, a lot it was Akeem Elijah Wan and 11 dudes in Houston. Yeah. Right, they'd have been better off with 11 dudes from Houston because then I would know they had some fight. Instead, it was just 11 dudes that happened to be in Houston. Magic, the 89, 90, and 91 teams are all on Magic's back. Those are not Showtime Lakers. You go look at that 91 roster that lost to Jordan, it's Magic and dudes. Well, and so there's, and so, and there's two other points to that. One is 89, they're going for the three P and Magic gets hurt, and you know what I mean, is not really able to compete the in the, in, in sorry, the, yeah, that's right. It's 89. 89 gets hurt, and Detroit ends up running away with it. In 90, Kareem is gone, and now all of a sudden, the scoring load, which Magic, Magic experienced, I got to carry this team scoring as a rookie in game six of the finals and dropped 42, and then a decade with Kareem, and then in 1990, he all of a sudden has back-to-back 40-point -back playoff games, which again validates the idea that if he had to fully carry scoring load, he could have, 
but was not because it wasn't what was needed or what was best for the team, which is also in a weird way, that run, even though it didn't have a championship, was similar to Steph's last championship, a validation of an already unimpeachably great career of, oh, when the circumstances change dramatically, you can even up your game or change your game. Where I think this should be stated is, I would have told you three years ago, this will never be a discussion. And the fact that Steph extended the prime post Durant, what he did in the playoff, in the championship run two years ago, and honestly, what he did in the playoffs last year with a broken team that was not a very good team, the 50 point game seven, all of it, it to me, it has put Steph at the very least in that top 10 conversation. And it makes the Steph versus Magic conversation legitimate, even though I think it's still clearly Magic. Yeah, like, the Magic thing that I think gets lost, and I understand why it gets lost, this whole he's a 6'9 point guard thing. I understand it right now. That doesn't seem like the craziest thing in the world to you because you've grown up in an era with LeBron James or all these switchable 6'9 yeah. sort of guys. However, to this day, other than LeBron, I can't think of how many guys Magic size were not just running the break from the middle, but also pushing the pace from the middle. Because even with LeBron, LeBron on the break at most dangerous is full head of steam, running on the wing. Yeah. What are you going to do on the three on two, right? Magic is accelerating the pace with the ball from the middle at 6'9 in an era where that honestly would have made him a big power forward. Like, that was a time where power forwards were honestly not even any good. Yep. And this guy was doing that from there. So, like, I think Steph has an argument depending on a few, like, very technical sorts of characteristics. And you can say, oh, well, you know, basically three is bigger than two. Yep. That, that's what gets us here is the fact that three is bigger than two, and it's way bigger than two by percentage. But, no, I, just, I can't. I can't either. I can't see it. But, again, if somehow – which is not going to happen this year, though I should never say anything's not going to happen with Steph because that guarantees that that's going to happen. They're not going to win a championship this year. If somehow he said, jump on my back, boys, and carry them it to a championship, a it changes everything. It changes a lot of math on a lot of things. And so the, and the last thing, your point about the pushing the pace is, I think, really interesting because when you're talking about six, eight plus point guards, I was thinking, well, Luca, but Luca's not pushing the pace. You know, Luca's not doing anything like what magic is doing it's a totally luke is doing just a bigger harden and a better harden speaking of harden that's where we go now <laughs> sorry um, i'm laughing already so what do you what do you make of harden doing everything he's done the last week okay this is what i make of the hard thing it, this is why i love this so much right these are two guys daryl Har i mean daryl morey and james harden who know each other very well and importantly oh their successes to the other correct both of them neither of them have all the money they got neither of them have all the prestige they have if not for the fact that they came across each other in the year 2012 so that the year harden and maury came together is actually the same year you and i met in person yes the, i was living in houston R before he traded for james harden daryl's biggest moves in houston were jeremy lynn and Omer Ashik, and it was known because he structured Ashik's contract in such a unique <laughs> way. Yes. And I always thought he was sharp. I always liked Daryl, but he had no nothing to show for what I thought was a brilliant basketball mind. And then he trades for Harden, and I remember going on the radio in Houston because it happened in October. It was a late, right before the season. Right started. before the season. And I said, I think James Harden can, by the end of this year, be one of the top 10 guys in the league. Like, fringe top 10. And in Houston, it was universally accepted as that is crazy. Like, what Daryl saw that Harden could be and what Harden could become under his system was... We now look back on it and people are like, oh, obvious. It was not no, obvious. No. It was not obvious at all and so 
to you, you and obviously for Daryl, Daryl probably was without that trade going to be out of a job and then not be Daryl Morey. So I'm I'm just a, agreeing with you entirely that those two guys coming together is what turned Daryl Morey into one of the moment he leaves Houston, he's the, one of the highest paid GMs in Philly and Harden into one of the most statistically decorated players yeah. in NBA history. And he's nearly made a billion dollars. Yes. Between basketball and Adidas. Yes. Like, correct. I would not be surprised if somebody added up all the James Harden money at this point and it stacked up to a billion dollars for a man who doesn't have a personality. But anyway, yep. it was one of the most prescient trades ever, though, but not just from the Rockets side, but also from the Thunder side because the Thunder got killed. Basically, all they got was Kevin Martin, Jeremy Lamb, and cap space when Kevin Martin's deal expired. And the pick that turned into Steven Adams, yes. which ended up being the Very best important. piece of the whole thing. Right. Very important, yep. right? But it was prescient for Oklahoma City in a way that people didn't realize at the time because Presty understood something that none of these people who've dealt with Harden understood since, which was, we got to get him out of here. Like, before the season so you starts. Think so? You think that's what – you yes. think that he was already showing this – I think signs. he knew – Okay. That. This is somewhat informed. Not enough for me to say out loud. Got it. Okay. But he knew we got to get this dude out of here. I knew they had to get him out of here just because that's the nature of things, right? He wasn't going to be no six man. Right. And still won his money. They had to get him out of here. So, Maury saw something in Harden that nobody else saw. Nobody saw. And Presty also saw something in Harden that nobody else had yep. seen yet. Sure. So, you fast forward to now, and Harden... Whatever lie he feels like he was told, it may have been a couple of lies, but whatever lie he felt like he was told, he felt like he was told. Daryl Morey, on the other hand, felt like I'm not giving James Harden away, right? Both of them knew that's how the other acts, right? Everybody knows James Harden's going to act up when it's time for him to go yeah. if you won't let him go. And everybody knows that Daryl Morey is not getting beat in a trade. No. But each of them looked at the other and said the same thing. Like, I see it like a movie where you imagine they show one person talking, and then they show the other person talking about the same thing, and then it comes together at the end, and they both are saying the same line, and that line is, but I know he ain't going to do me like that. Not after everything I did for him. Oh, that's and here we are. Here we are. They both thought the other would not be the person that they were because he wouldn't do me like that. The, so, so much of this is fascinating to me. I want to talk on the lie part for first, okay? So Harden, and I don't think it is, I I think it should be mentioned, and I understand Harden has a massive economy in China that the, <laughs> that's his, really his only fan base left yes. is China. But it also should be noted, so I, and he has events there, him torching Mori in China. Yes. When, if you remember, Daryl's tweet supporting Hong Kong, yes. it was something that almost, it, it seemed like might cost Daryl his career. I mean, he messed every, he, he cost the NBA about as much money as COVID. Yeah, correct. That's not an exaggeration. Uh, or at least that's what people say. Yeah. And, the, and so there's that kind of undertone to it. Then there is, what is he saying you lied about? Because if he's saying you lied about you're going to trade me and you're not trading me, there is no problem. If he is saying what I think he wanted people to believe he was saying, you told me last year when I gave back the $14 million that there was a max deal waiting for me, like everyone speculated, and to be fair, like the NBA did launch an investigation last year about, found no, that it was not true, and then the Rockets or the Sixers got docked for early contact P.J., and house the guys they were able to get with the money yes. from the Harden thing. If that were true, it would be catastrophic for the Philadelphia 76ers, for Daryl Morey, for everybody. I do not believe that's true. I do not believe Daryl and the NBA doesn't believe it, and now Harden is saying he didn't do it. But I know some people do believe that that's what happened here. There was a handshake deal. So let me ask this question to you. Because I don't think this point's been made enough. Bill Simmons, to his credit, uh, tweeted about it when the story first broke. I, he and I are in somewhat lockstep about it. But it, Well, I shouldn't say we're in lockstep because I'm not going to say exactly. I don't want to say what Bill believes. But let's just say for a moment they did have a handshake deal. If you're on, and people are like, oh, well, if that's the case, Daryl you know, broke his word. If I'm on the side of, okay, take less money. You got a max contract waiting for you. 
once you make clear to every NBA reporter in the world you plan to go to Houston this offseason, do I have right to say, well, I guess the fucking deal's off? <laughs> do I have every right to say whatever handshake deal we had if you are from Christmas Day through May telling everyone that'll listen, you're going to Houston, am I still supposed to then be like, well, if they don't want you, I've got you? Or does that nix whatever deal we had? Because I would, again, I don't think there was a deal. But if there was, and I was in the Sixers case, I would be like, well, I guess he doesn't think there's a deal, so I guess we're off the hook. Isn't that legitimate? I think it would be legitimate, but I absolutely believe that there was a deal. And the reason that I believe that there was a deal is nothing about James Harden implies, hey, I think he's willing to make some sacrifices to win because I do think he wants to win very badly. I think that the poor behavior that he's demonstrated in all these moves lately those weren't about money, right? If he wanted the money, he could have stayed in Houston. Fertitta would have given him $50 million a year for two more. And they and in Brooklyn, remember, he turned down three for 161 right. at, before the second season there. Right. James Harden would be one of the greatest players of all time unequivocally with a championship. And I think he wants that. Like, he does not – there's a rarefied air that we don't talk about. Also, yet. I think how badly he wants to win is evidenced by – how much the playoffs get to him. Yes. I think he gets ner yes. I think I I do think that is true. I do think he wants it so badly that it then manifests itself in fear yeah. during postseason games. Yeah. Go I ahead. Mean, we we saw that to a degree with Jimmy Butler in the finals where it's like, oh what's wrong with Jimmy Butler? Is he hurt? No, he's pressing. Yeah. Right? Like these things happen. I think he wants to win. Do I think he wants to win enough to give back thirteen million dollars and then everything else that came behind it? No. I don't. I don't think that man is wired like that. I think for whatever reason, he thought he was going to be taken care of. Now, I do think you make an interesting point there that if he then says, well, I'm going to go to Houston, but Daryl knows James. James knows. His number one weapon in negotiation is pain. I got to make these people feel pain in yeah. order to get what I want. So if I'm Daryl, I'm like, no, I'm probably still going to give this to you because in the end, if they had given it to him, I think James would have taken it because James wants to win. And James was not going to go to what that clown show was looking like at the time in Houston. That, that's my thought on it. But somewhere along the way, after he gave back the money and everything else, whether Daryl Morey was going to get a good deal on that trade or not, you had to take care of the dude, man. Well, here's the thing. And it's your guy. I think that's the other part, too. It is your, your guy. It is your guy, but also, the, I mean, what I would argue, I would argue that Harden over the last week has mishandled this immensely. Yes. Do you think Damian Lillard is going to be on the Blazers this year? Yes. Oh, okay. All right, well, I wasn't even trying to have a Dame conversation. I don't, but the reason I bring it up is he hasn't been traded yet, and I think that it is fair, even if you disagree, a lot of people think, but he will be at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I think at some point he'll be traded, but I think he'll be a Blazer. Okay, oh, you think he'll start a Blazer yes. and then be traded. So that's kind of my point is Harden... To me, those comments harden. If you're gonna if you're gonna play that card, you almost got to play it either days before the season starts or days before the trade deadline. But pulling that parachute when there is still plenty, we're in August, yeah. seems premature and seems hasty. I also think that what is undeniable is this: if Harden's right now biggest upset is about the money it does anybody think what he is doing right here is going to lead to more money <laughs> no or is this so so i the the reason i thought he wanted the clippers here's my theory it was not los angeles and it was not about ability to win it was about if he were traded to the clippers they would be able to max him and them moving into a new arena with the uncertainty of Kawhi and Paul George with that owner, that's one of the only people that would max him, yes. but they can't if he's a free agent. He has to already have been on the team. So I think all of this was for James's purposes about how do I get, I, I didn't take the extension in Houston. I didn't take the extension in Brooklyn. I, I dropped my salary $14 million last offseason. We're now we're now up to maybe almost 150 million dollars left on the table. 
And I think you saw the real anxiety in that by him picking up this option rather than just being a free agent. But I will tell you this. If he, if they don't trade him and he dogs it, I think, I think he could be looking at less than $20 million on a contract Ooh, see, that's for a, one year. That's an interesting question, and I might have been inclined to agree with you if I didn't just see somebody give Kyrie Irving 40 something million dollars a year for three years. Is that what the deal is? Yeah. Two plus one? Y- yes, and with the player option on the uh, – the, the plus one is not team, yeah. it's player. Yes, but that team – had to keep him because they couldn't let they had traded for him mm-hmm. and they couldn't you know risk him walking out for nothing and then Luca walking out and then Luca which is the, what's so interesting about the Kyrie Harden thing is those are big stories but the bigger story is what that domino will impact Luca and Embiid yeah and whether or not those guys either one of them is going to say I'm sick of this I let uh, the so where do you think the Harden thing lands? And then we'll wrap this part up. So it's when you mentioned that about Embiid, I wanted to get to that because that to me is totally where this gets to be fun, right? I think with healthy James Harden, healthy Kawhi Leonard, whatever that is anymore, right? And healthy Paul George, maybe the best team in the NBA in terms of your chances of winning a championship. And it's great for Harden because Harden's problem, as we talked about, pressing at the end, right? You ain't got to do that. No, Kawhi will you, take care of it if he's playing. You've got maybe the best big game player in the NBA. Kawhi Leonard has a case for being the best big yeah. game player in the NBA. Paul George is your number two, and James Harden gets to be point guard, which, by the way, he's willing to do. Yep. The problem with the Sixers, and this is where if I'm Daryl, I might play this a little different. You've got your chance to tear this whole thing down because I am now convinced that the ceiling on that team is the second round, and I'm convinced the ceiling on that team is the second round because I don't think you can win with Joel, and I don't think you can win with Harden. The thing with Joel that people lose sight of, he puts those big numbers up in the regular season because he's using 38% of the possessions. In the playoffs, he only uses 28% of the possessions, or I think that's what it was last year. He can't be the same dude, and if he can't be that dude, he can't carry you, and if he can't carry you, that team's not good enough to win. Harden is not the guy that could be your number two, and then you win. Tobias Harris is your number three. It's now time to tear this thing down to the screws. And they could do that if Joel Embiid gets up and says, I'm sick of this, and I feel fairly confident he is, in fact, sick of it. Well, I mean, he certainly, listen, it's hard to take anything Joel does on social seriously because he literally calls himself Troel Embiid. Yes. So he wants, but it, if, listen, Embiid's got to wear the fact that his playoff resume is not impressive. Now, he has had some bad luck. Yes. He's been injured. He gets elbowed in the face, breaks his face. His knees hurt. He's had a lot of injuries. But he is a guy that, for his career, averages damn near 30. And in the playoffs, averages around 23. He is the only MVP in the history of the league to not make round three. The only one. The wow. only Yeah. The only MVPs to not make a finals are him, Nash, and Derrick Rose. Rose. And there might be one other from a long time ago, but I don't. I think that's it. I did this the other day. Um, but he's never even made a round three, which is wild. When you know, Oh, the other one was Jokic, but yeah. Jokic obviously then made the finals. Your guy. Oh, you, you, oh, you were compiling man. those stats when you oh, were hating? <laughs> yeah, that's right. By the way, it should be noted that but I was one of the – only people to be a multiple time guest on uh game theory is yes. that correct one you time the, you and Stephen a smith are the only multiple yeah and and one time was like a social only thing and one yes. time was on uh tv or maybe i don't it doesn't matter uh but uh bomani and i had a lot of really loud i was more loud than him arguments about Jokic, and if you go back and watch them Bomani ended up being right on all. Of it. <laughs> it's yes. really unfortunate. Dude, that's me and Steph. It's like, I'm terrified of saying bad things about it, Steph. It's really unfortunate. Oh, speaking of Steph, it's so funny. Uh, so, the quarterback documentary comes out, and P- I have, people text me. They're like, you're in the first episode. You're all over it. I'm like, this is great for me. Hard Knocks comes out, and people are like, you're in the first, you, your guy shows in the first episode. I'm like, that's awesome. Steph's documentary comes out. 
people text me. They're like, you're in the final episode. I'm like, that is a disaster. <laughs> I was like, there is no chance that's good. Yeah. I was like, the Mahomes thing, that's going to be good. Me being hesitant about the Jets, I think that plays. But if I'm in the the culmination of the Steph Curry doc, it's not because I'm like, the guy's amazing. <laughs> Yo, my, you know my guy Dominique Foxworth, who got on TV and did the, the, the No More Championships oh, yeah. thing? And Steph did that at the Victory Parade and oh, everything else. So good. I'm so, like, I have not seen Steph in years. I'm terrified of what will happen when I see him because he doesn't forget anything. Oh, so And, I mean, I was right until I was wrong. I mean, that's how you feel about Jokic. You were right until you was wrong. Right until I was wrong. <laughs> and, by the way, I listen, the... The, the here is what I'll say about the Yokes thing, and then we quickly move on. Um, I do not tend to get bothered by things written about me, or YouTube videos made about me, or social media stuff. Yeah, you've been like, an asshole for a long time. Yeah, okay, sure. say, say, yeah, 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 yeah. You just gotta at some point you gotta decide: is am I gonna allow this to occupy? All my waking moments or just – now, the downside to just being like I'm going to ignore it is, as has happened over the last few months with a lot of the speculation about shows on FS1, is there are a lot of flatly, not only like kind of incorrect, but just like markedly wrong things written. You, you've dealt with this in a much more toxic extent. And the quest, the problem is, if you res- once you respond to one, not responding in the future feels like it is an admission. Right. So it's like, do I want to open the doors to responding to any of it? Because then I am almost required to respond to all of it. Or am I just going to let this bullshit, you know what I mean, float right. out there and ignore it? Um, the reason I said all this with the yoke stuff, and I'll let you respond to that. The only thing that bothers me, like that, I shouldn't say the only thing that bothers me. The thing that really bothers me is when people take things that I did say and video that does exist about Jokic from two years ago. Right. And it's fine if they say, this is where Nick thought, but then cut the video and tweet out, even after he won the title, Nick Wright won't give Jokic any love. And I'm like, I'm in my house doing that. Yeah. It's COVID. <laughs> how, do you, how do you think I said this after he won the championship? That does bother Oh, no, no. You showed up. Like, it's kind of like with me and Josh Allen the day I looked up and realized I'm not going to fight this anymore. Credit to you. You still, still got the, it. Yeah, you still got still the stamina. It. Yeah. Like, I, I was, I'm ready to come back. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm ready That's, to come back yeah. around, but I needed a break. You know what I'm saying? But you're 100% correct that you say these things, like the old takes exposed guy, who I like generally as person, right? But I had to get on him at one point where I'm like, look, man, you pulling this tweet from Dabo Swinney in 09 when we all thought that he stunk. Yeah. And then coming back after a miraculous turnaround and being like, oh, look at all these guys who thought Dabo couldn't coach. You mean every single person on earth? Right. <laughs> In that moment? Um, all right. Last one on basketball, and we get to the NFL, yes. and we'll do this very quickly. Anthony Edwards ceiling. <laughs> you know what his ceiling is for me? It ain't even a basketball ceiling. Finally, a player to love. Oh. And this is what I, I was hanging out with my man, uh, Trey Vaughn. Used to be Black Trey on Twitter okay. um, at The Athletic. And uh, my brother, and we were talking about I was watching online. Have you ever seen the clip of the first game of Adrian Dantley? Uh, coming back against the Pistons after Isaiah got him traded, or he believed Isaiah got him traded. Oh, when he was traded for Mark Aguirre. Yeah. No, I haven't seen it. Okay, so they go around, right? It's the pregame, and it's the dap, and it's a big deal because Isaiah, uh, Isaiah Thomas is coming. I mean, Andrea Danley has come back. And so Isaiah comes to get the dap to uh, Danley, and Danley gets him and then pulls him in. Oh, okay. And keep it in mind that Danley is like eight years older than Isaiah. Pulls him in and gets in his ear, and it's just Ba 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 ba, and you see Isaiah try to laugh it up and walk away, and Dantley grabs his hand and pulls him back, okay. and keeps going. It had Isaiah so thrown off, he shot an air ball in the first shot of the game. Now Isaiah came back and shot thirty, but I say that to say there was a time where this game was much more human and much more personal, and it felt like people were playing as opposed to like statistical avatars or these guys that we built up since they were children yeah. to be wage earners. Like, it was like watching people play at the playground. It had that sort of, like, visceral emotion. Anthony Edwards is the most real human being I feel like I've seen be a star basketball player 
in such a long time. And I was watching that game on Sunday because I was on the phone with my man Biddy Goodwill, and he's like, yo, you might want to turn on this uh, Anthony Edwards thing. I didn't even know it was on TV. And I'm looking at him, and the way he's doing it is like, oh, this is personal to him. This matters to him. Not even as personal in the sense that Germany did something to me, but there's a level at which he cares that is throwback in the way that he carries himself and does all these things that is throwback. And so he's, what, 22 years old, mature in a way that he doesn't get nearly enough credit for because he got to carry old Carl yeah. around because Carl actor. can't get this job done. He's a good done. actor, too. He's got yes. that going for him. Yeah, like once they get Carl out of town, I think the sky's the limit. All right, so here's your um, your pal, someone I don't know, but I follow on Twitter, Miles Brown. Yes. He's a Timberwolves fan. He lives there, right? Yes. He lives in Minnesota. Um, He made the accurate point, which is it is truly a shame that Minnesota made the mistake so many te- we saw the hornets make it with anthony davis we saw the mavs make it twice now with luka we saw the cavs make it with lebron you wish someone would learn from it which is you get you get this great young player and because he's so good so early you get overly excited and try to microwave everything mm-hmm. Because if right now Minnesota simply had all the assets from the Gobert trade, so you have Kessler, Walker Kessler, yes. you have those four first-round picks, you have all of that, and then Carl Towns as a trade chip plus all those things, we would be saying, oh, they could get Embiid. They could get they, – they would have sut- – instead – they went all in on the Gobert piece. Now, you still can trade Carl Towns, but your instead of limitless optimism about what they could become, it is capped to a degree. I don't hate Gobert's fit with, with Anthony Edwards. I don't. I don't love his fit with Carl Towns, and I don't like, honestly, I, I don't like much of, of Carl Towns, the basketball player. Like, I just yeah. don't. I, the, I think a lot of it's empty calories, and I think some of his – comments this summer have just been so wildly delusional that I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could trust him to yeah. know what, you know, what you need to be to have a real winning team. But Anthony Edwards is thrilling. And the point that I've made to you privately and maybe publicly, I don't know, is the spot for best American player is wide open. Oh, oh yeah. It's, it's him. <laughs> it, it, I think well, it's going to... He's top two. He's what, top three, I would say. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I don't think it's him yet because Tatum obviously Correct. is there. But it looked like that was what Nike was betting on Ja. Yes. And that, they had Ja and Zion. Like, one of them is going to be it. Zion will see. Ja will see. Tatum is, to me, a great player that we know. I think Tatum's, you know destined to be a consistent all-NBA great player that will never be the best player in the league. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just my opinion. Uh, But that best American-born player, because the best player, your list of the best players is probably going to have four or five foreign guys on it before you get to the best American. But Anthony Edwards could snatch that title, and with that charisma, and again, I don't want to sound like jingoistic, but there is something to being the best American, that there is yeah. some marketing to it that is available that isn't typically available to the international players. He is making a strong case for but it. But this is where I talk about that that human part about Edwards. If Jason Tatum was wired like Anthony Edwards is wired, Jason Tatum would be the best player in the NBA. That might be right. I, I don't think it matters to him in the same way. And that's not to say he doesn't care or anything like that. But the way that we watch those Celtics and the way that we watch them fall apart and the way that he we... He just doesn't ever seem to play angry. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Yes. Like, there's not that I can turn this thing on and make it happen sort of thing. And that, to me, is the thing with Edwards. Now, to me, where Minnesota messed up, Part of it is obviously all they gave up for the Gobert trade. They wanted to make a big splashy move yep. when they got in there, and they decided to let Carl, Carl, and I have to be careful when I talk about him because it's hard for me to be honest and not sound really mean, and I don't know that guy, so I don't want to do that. At the same time, the splashy move they needed to make was not to trade the world Rudy Gobert. The move was to get in immediately if you're Tim Connolly, the new GM part owner, all of that stuff, and get Carl out of there. Yeah. Like at some point you got to look up and realize, yes, he's really tall and he can shoot threes. 
But the fact that he brags about being the best shooting big man of all time, that's like saying, ain't no accountant that can dance like me. I'm sure that's really good at the Christmas party and everybody likes it, but I just got audited. Yeah. Right? Like, they just they come in and they take in my cars. And you're supposed to stop them from taking the cars. And people take cars, cars all the time. Yeah. Right? I, that, that was the move they needed to make was to get them out of there. But now they made the trade with Gobert, which completely changed the trade market. And now you can't trade a player like Carl Towns unless you get, like, eight first-round yeah. picks because everybody thinks that you got got the correct. And so the – that but the bright side is if you're a Timberwolves fan who I believe – they have won. They have one season that they won yes. a playoff series in their team's history. That is correct. The conference finals in run 04. with Cassell, KG, obviously, and Sprewell. So they've won two playoff series in their franchise history. Uh, you have Anthony Edwards, which will be wildly exciting. All right, Jonathan Taylor's trade stuff. <laughs> Bomani and I being the only people in the world that seem to find the Trey Lance situation as absurd as it actually is. And I would argue, and this might surprise some of some folks, I would argue that there are not five people in the world that know more about college football than Bomani Jones. And I don't think anybody, uh, I shouldn't say anybody, I think uh, I think the casual sports media viewer doesn't associate you with college football. I want to talk to you about the only college football player that matters to me this year. We will do all of that next. What's Right, episode 172. All right, welcome back in episode 172. What's Right with Nick Wright. Bamani Jones in today. Bo, thank you for being here with us. By the way, in the C block, we'll answer your listener questions. Uh, if you guys want to ask, since you know questions directly to Bomani, you you feel free to do that. It doesn't have to be necessarily Yo, just me like, and you are such radio guys because I still call them all listeners. Oh, we're yeah. sitting here on the YouTube, whatever it is, they're yeah. all listeners to me. <laughs> That's true. And the people who are just listeners on the podcast, they are listening to it after we do it and literally cannot participate yes. in the YouTube <laughs> yes. chat. Everyone that could respond to that listener inquiry are viewers. You are correct on that. All right, we did 40 minutes on the NBA there. Now to the NFL. Jonathan Taylor, the Colts have now said he can see- seek out a trade, just got to find a team that's willing to give them a first-round pick. It is, I think, going to be an impossible standard. Yes. I I also think the Colts are saying we don't value – we don't look at you as a prime asset, but we are demanding a prime asset in yes. return for you, which seems incongruous. Uh, I also think that teams are – there are certain teams that should never invest heavily in a running back. I think, the, I think one of the few mistakes, significant mistakes, the Chiefs have made under Brett Veach – was the first-round pick on Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Now, I liked it at the time. I was excited about it. Uh, but you look back and you're like, could have, you know, the, for a team like that, the position is fungible, and you can find Pacheco in the seventh round, whatever it is. I also think there are certain teams whose best and most respected player in the locker room happens to be a running back, and treating that player like... He is just a cog in the wheel, has obvious, clear downstream effects on your ability to change a culture, have your players buy in, all of it. I thought the Giants were playing a very risky game with Saquon. He is the universally respected best player on the team, one of the longest tenured guys, and you're just telling him basically, "Ah, bleep you, figure it out. Now, he ended up accepting the money, so maybe it's okay. If I am the Colts, and I have drafted one of the rawest quarterback prospects in the last decade with the fourth overall pick. Is it in your? Is it not worth it to slightly overpay for Jonathan Taylor? So A, Anthony Richardson has Jonathan Taylor hand the ball off to, and so B, you can go into this season all pushing in one direction, trying to build something for this young quarterback, even if 
in two years, that's a bad contract for Jonathan Taylor. That's how I would view it in this specific situation. How do you view it? Well, I think the Colts also need to think about it like this. Saquon Barkley seemed to be just a little bit offended by the way that it was all going. Jonathan Taylor is hot. Yes. Like, he is furious. Like, they needed, if your plan was, yo, you're going to come back, you needed to do something with this. Because what I think people lose sight of with Jonathan Taylor, this will sound crazy to people. Jonathan Taylor might be the most underrated football player of his generation. Okay. And this is what I mean. Jonathan Taylor was at Wisconsin for three years and ran for 6,000 yards. Yeah, that's pretty good. Never even got to be a Heisman Trophy finalist. Like, never that. was on that level. There was a time where Jonathan Taylor would have walked into the NFL as one of the most famous people in America just on the strength of being such a great college football running back. Like, 2,000 yards was some wild stuff. He did that two times and overall had 6,000 yards. He feels slighted at every turn, if I had to guess. And apparently he got an agent that put a battery in his back. That's got him all charged up about this. But I think you're right. If you're the Colts, especially since you're dealing with a rookie quarterback that's not throwing the budget up that high Exactly. At that you place, have the money right now. Go ahead now. and do this. You remember, because you were heavily involved in the story, but Adrian Peterson got in trouble yep. with the situation with his son. Yep. The Vikings were still like, oh, well, when he comes back, we're yes. going to keep him because he's our guy. And we yes. built this around him, and he's taking 200-something carries a year. And you got to tell everybody else here, we will reward you for making this sort of contribution. If I'm the Colts, and by the way, if it works with Anthony Richardson. Well, that, I love that pick because if you're in the AFC, you have to shoot the moon at quarterback. Yeah. And I don't – Bryce Young – I just I don't believe because of the size. I just he's just yeah, not here beneath the minimum. CJ Stroud, I think, has very, very low chance of being great. Right. I'm not saying he's not gonna be fine. Right. But in the AFC, fine gets you nowhere. Yeah. You you be fine and be the twelfth best quarterback yeah. in the conference. But Anthony Richardson could be awesome. But if you're gonna play him this year, and I don't see any way in the world he is ready to play NFL football. Then you have to have based, a then you gotta have Taylor. And by the way, Bo said the thing about Jonathan Taylor's college stats. His freshman year he had nineteen hundred and seventy seven rushing yards. His sophomore year, he had 2,194, and his and junior year had 2,003. That's what I'm saying. He had 6,174 in three years. You still remember Ron Dane to this day. Yeah. And Ron Dane got famous off a freshman year like that that yeah. stayed around into winning the, the same Heisman college. Trophy. At the same college. Yeah. I feel like Melvin Gordon was a little more, like, well-known at the same college. Melvin Gordon, who should have won the Heisman that year, at least was the runner-up for yeah. the Heisman that year. All right. So let me, let's go to the trade market just for a moment. Because with everything I just said about running backs, here is the one thing that I think people have slightly wrong about this story. When they're like, well, he definitely won't be traded because no one's going to give up a premium draft pick just to have the privilege of having to give him the contract. I would argue if you trade for him, you don't have to give him the contract because... I think you, Jonathan Taylor, can play this card, which is a totally fair and legitimate card to play. I've done all this for you at the Colts. You guys have undervalued me. You're not extending me. I'm not playing. You know, or he, not that he said he's not playing, but this kind of soft mm -hmm. holdout thing. I think that's legitimate. If he is traded, I do not think he can go to the new place and be like, I'm not playing unless you pay me. I think the the card can get you out of Indy or it can get you paid in Indy. I don't think he has enough juice to get have the card get him out of Indy and a new contract somewhere else. So if I am a team that is close, would I trade a first round pick? Probably not. Would I put would I consider would I say if I were the Buffalo Bills, and I know they've spent multiple second round picks on running backs, they haven't seemed to hit if I were the Cincinnati Bengals, who I, I think Joe Mixon's yeah. on the wrong side. If I were trying to think of a team in the NFC that is arguably close. The, it's not, it's the, the Lions just draft a running back. The Seahawks just draft a running back. But if I were in that close tier, would I say, is it worth $3 million this year plus a f running back franchise tag next year? For John, a second round pick for Jonathan Taylor, I think it would be. Yeah, and I think that wherever he goes, 
he's just going to, I don't think he's going to get that contract extension. Like, I just think it's unfortunate, but I don't think he's going to have the leverage or the juice for it. And so I think there are a handful of teams that should be having meetings of, is he worth a premium pick because he is going to be cheap? I don't think they got to give him the long-term Yeah, deal. And I think you raise an interesting point when you bring up Buffalo because they have kept trying to do this yes. with the James Cooks of the world, yep. the Devin Singletary's and everything else. Look, man, a special running back is a special running back. And going into the draft this year, I understood everything that everybody was saying, but I was terrified more than anything else. And I don't have a rooting interest in this. I was terrified just because it would be this scary. If Philadelphia had taken Bijan, I don't know how anybody ever would have stopped him last year. They could have come out here and run to Veer. They could have run to Bone. They could have run to run and shoot. They could have run anything if they had Bijan Robinson because Bijan Robinson is that special. San Francisco didn't lose a game, as I recall, after they got uh, Christian McCaffrey. They lost the first game to the Chiefs. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, they, but, they, once, but remember, he was traded for like midweek that right. week. They didn't lose a game with right. him until the end. Because he time. mattered. He was that special. Now, if you don't think Taylor is necessarily that special, because we're talking about these Swiss Army Knife yeah. guys that can do Marshall, sure. Marshall Falk stuff, then maybe not. But a special running back still matters. You can replace certain running backs with the Isaiah Pacheco's of the world and get in and do it functionally. Yep. But if you got a great one, yeah, I, that, I, that, like Tennessee with Derrick Henry becomes another example. So, a hundred percent. And what I, the team that I think should call the Colts and say, hey. We spent the 52nd pick of the draft on running back Zach Charbonnet. So people liked him. We will give you him and a fifth next year. You get to reset the clock on your running back salary. Still have a ready-to-go running back. We'll take Jonathan Taylor. If you're Seattle and you think in the NFC, if Geno can keep this up, that to me makes a lot of sense, man. Like, mm-hmm. now Seattle might say, we've, you know, because they drafted Kenneth Walker in the second round last year. They spent back to back second round picks on running backs. But that's why Seattle doesn't make sense trading a draft pick for him. But if you trade one of those guys as an asset for him, that to me is is worth discussing. Now, the, the flip side is if people think Jonathan Taylor, who was injured last year, you know what I mean, that he got used up at Wisconsin, had 1,800 yards in year two, and now he's a declining player. That's different. But if you think last year was the aberration, I still think he has real value. All right. The Trey Lance thing. (laughs) So here's the deal. I want to shout out, you know Danny Parkins. Yes. Uh, You don't, uh, I think, know Andrew Filippone. Andrew does radio in Pittsburgh. Danny does radio in Chicago. I went to college with both of them, two of my best friends. They do a podcast called First and Pod. Uh, it's an NFL-only podcast. It comes out twice a week. People, in addition, subscribing to The Right Time with Bumani Jones, that if you're just now joining us, still exists and is coming to your podcast feed shortly. Uh, by shortly, I mean soon, oh, like sure. later today. Sure, fair. Yeah, I just didn't want them to think it was coming out like yeah. the day after this. But very soon, coming shortly. First and Pod's a great NFL podcast. They, to their credit, they are two of only maybe five people, and we are two of the other five, that find the Trey Lance situation baffling and galling. And I want to make this very clear. I am not arguing that Trey Lance is awesome. I have no clue. I am stating the fact that the biggest quarterback busts ever all got three times, four times, five times the opportunity to show whether or not they could play. Jamarcus Russell, Tim Couch, Ryan Leaf, Zach Wilson. Trey Lance has started four games. One of them, by the way, he broke his leg three plays in. Another one was in a monsoon the week before. Right. He, The San Francisco 49ers took a player who barely played D2 college football, traded three first-round picks for him. Then, after they got to an NFC Championship game with their quarterback, said, you can't play for us anymore. We're locking you out of the building. Had Brock Purdy on the team, said Trey Lance is our unquestioned week one starter. He played a game in a monsoon, played three plays in another game, broke his leg. And now they have said, He is out 
maybe not even the backup, and Brock Purdy, the final pick of the draft who we passed on seven times for drafting him, is our unquestioned starter. It is... Bro, coming off Tommy John. Come, you're right, coming, a guy who was physically limited coming into the NFL, coming off surgery on his throwing arm. He is our unquestioned starter. It is one of the most indefensible processes I've ever seen. And I cannot believe everyone is just pretending to believe, oh, well, it, it's because Brock Purdy's awesome. Brock Purdy is not awesome. And I don't, I don't think it has been given enough attention how they have mismanaged this situation. You go ahead. Yo, so the black quarterback level of this is the lack of patience. And I don't necessarily mean that from Shanahan. I mean for fans. Just the, hey, Lance stinks. You've seen him play like three games. Yeah. Like, I'm amazed at how certain they are that he stinks after seeing him play three games and how certain they are that Purdy is awesome after, after seeing, seeing play a, seven. By the way, a similar sample size to which you had before you said Jimmy Garoppolo was awesome before you ultimately understood that Jimmy Garoppolo was simply Jimmy Garoppolo, yes. right? That's the, the part for Lance that is frustrating in the discourse is that, just how quickly people are to dismiss him. Now, I watched some of them clips from the last game he played. He did look like rat ass. I don't want to pretend as though I do oh, not I, I think he looks bad, but I don't yeah. think that's – but I, I think that's almost – independent of yeah that's a secondary point yes. right what confuses me about this they traded all those picks to get him and i don't think that this is a sunk cost fallacy right because i get the argument that well you shouldn't lean in on him just because you traded all those picks for him no that is exactly why you should lean on him right you once you decide we're going to trade three first round picks to go get this guy you're not saying and we're gonna see how this works out we're gonna make this work we go show up every day. There's going to be somebody with Trey on the phone, going through the playbook, whatever it is, and maybe they're doing these things. But I've seen no investment from the team to make sure that this trade, that, by the way, could cripple them for the next five years just because of what they're not getting back in terms right. of personnel. The fact that they're not like, nah, baby, we're going to one way or another make this work. And to me, the first step in we're going to make this work is you're the backup. Even if you decide Brock Purdy's our starter this year, we're not entertaining this Sam Darnold. We're not that, entertaining that's this the Sam Darnold. Shit. That's the part crazy. to me that that made this an even bigger story. Was if they want to say Brock Purdy earned it, we believe in him, we found it, and the absolute diamond in the rough, his elbow's going to be fine, he's the yeah. starter, so be it. We know what Sam Darnold is. To not then say, Tra not only is Trey Lance our backup, he's going to have a package. He's going to have a package because he does things mobility-wise yeah. Purdy can't do. So that, to me, is where I was like, this train's off the tracks. And here's the other part of it. Th their quarterback evaluation process was, by just the, on, the, the historical record, we love this player so much, we're trading three first-round picks to get him. We see him for one year in our building, in our practice, in our camp. We believe in him enough. We are telling Jimmy Garoppolo, you can't, your keys to the building are revoked. Tried to trade you to Washington. You have a surprise surgery, so we can't, but we wanted to. He's our guy. He is our week one starter. He then breaks his leg and is not able to play for months. So he went from deposing Garoppolo, week one unquestioned starter, to potential third string in OTAs? Right. When was it? It wasn't. It's not like, oh, he had terrible practices. The guy wasn't practicing. The guy had a broken leg last year. He wasn't practicing. None of it. And the, the trade part of it is that it, I, the, the Niners, when they did it, I believe the thought process was with the Shanahan system, we can be pretty damn good with just C level, pardon me, C level quarterbacking. If we were to get A-level quarterbacking, we will be the best team in the league by far. And by the way, I agree with that. Yeah, I think the Niners with that roster and that offense and that defense. Now, the defensive brain drain of losing Salah and losing D'Amico, we'll see how it works. That team, if they had a difference maker at quarterback, would be the best team in football. Better than the Chiefs. So I get why they tried to do it. But if now they are pivoting back to just anybody, yeah. is plug and play, then you, 
you know, do you know who was drafted with the first first round pick San Francisco traded away for Trey Lance? Because I'm looking at it right now. All right, so they made I can't even remember who they made that trade with. Well, it was it was like the it was Miami, but it was like a three. It was they had yeah. someone else's pick. Point is this: they were drafting at number twelve. Okay, I'm just going to tell you who went, how that top twelve of the draft went. It went Trevor Lawrence. Obvious. Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson, who everyone locked in stone immediately. That was, the, never that was strange, any, too. I knew that there was going to be no discussion about the number one pick. Like, and obviously, the number two pick, Zach Wilson, whatever. Number three, Trey Lance, okay? Number four, Kyle Pitts, who I still think could be awesome. Number five, Jamar Chase, who unquestionably is awesome. Number six, Jalen Waddell, who is fantastic. Number seven, Panay Sewell. Number eight, J.C. Horn, guy popped his Achilles, hasn't worked out. Number nine, Pat Sertan II, who some people think is the best corner in football. Number 10, Devontae Smith. Number 11, Justin Fields, who I think could have been dynamic in this offense if you wanted to trade up for three and draft him. And number 12, sitting there at the pick the Niners traded away, is Micah Parsons. (laughs) Micah Parsons and Nicky Bosa on yes. that defense is what they traded away. Well, well, it, with with Fred Warner, by the way, right? Oh yeah, with, with Fred Warner, with Armstead. But also think about this: if you just wanted a plug and play quarterback, you could have stayed there and got Corkle. Yes, correct. Corkle, Corkle was right there. Mac Jones, exactly. They right. tricked us into thinking they were trading up to get Corkle. Yeah, exactly right. And the you or you could have stayed there, and if you wanted a dual threat traded up a few spots and gotten Justin Fields when you see he's not going top five. And then, by the way, they didn't have – this is to your point. The 29th pick of the draft the next year would have been theirs, and they didn't have that. Now, that ended up being Cole Strange, Mm -hmm. but we'll see. And then this year, the draft pick they didn't have was – what pick was that? I'll find it. It's from San Francisco. Uh, The 29th pick again. So it's the 12th pick, the 29th pick, and the 29th pick for a guy you're not going to – who is getting less rope than any first? Forget people talk about any top five quarterback. Any the only first round quarterbacks to get this. It's the le, it's the least since Jim Drunken Miller yeah. and Andre Ware. Yeah, and the and Andre Ware at least got years, but he just never right. got on the field, never got opportunity. But, but think about this: as we mentioned, Sam Darnold here. You're telling me we saw Sam Darnold play here, right? Yes. We know what time it was. We know what time yes. it wasn't. But you're telling me that Sam Darnold still has a chance to get better, and Trey Lance does not. And Sam Darnold, at his worst, who got all the opportunities, simply did not look like an NFL quarterback. But people are still willing to bet on the idea of Sam Darnold as the backup here than Trey Lance. And Go ahead. And a number. this is another big one, and this is Kyle Shanahan has to answer for this because he skated on it the last time. This will be the second time that you've had a top three quarterback and you broke him. Oh. And, the, and we blamed it the last time on the other guy. We blamed it on injuries. Robert Griffin, right? Like, yep. we blamed it on injuries and everything else. But what was so wild about Griffin by the time you got to year three, really, and Shanahan was gone by then, but by the time you got to year three, he looked like he forgot how to do stuff that he knew how to do before. Correct. And now I'm looking at Trey Lance, and he looks utterly confounded in the preseason. So, genius man, what are you doing? Well, what I'm looking at with Trey Lance, and this is to me what matters, is the guy played 16 games as the starter at North Dakota State in 2019. He then played one game in 2020. Did not play in 2021 for the Niners. Well, no, that's not true. Played two games in 2021 for the Niners and a game and a couple snaps in 2022. You drafted him knowing. All he these played, things. He played almost no college football and was playing at the D2 level. To not assume it was that he was going to need some game action, it's just baffling to me. All right, let's move on. But I'll say one last thing on that. That's what happens when your boss didn't want you in the first place. I've lived that life. Shanahan didn't want But that's that's exactly what I was about to say. But it doesn't make sense because Kyle Shanahan's completely in charge. You think he has more power than Lynch? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, yeah. I mean, he hired Lynch. Yeah, that's fair. So the... It's baffling. All right, I'm going to skip the Aaron Rodgers thing because we've been going on so long. 
I just want to go to college football here quickly. So I did a quarterback pyramid, otherwise known as Mahomes Mountain. (laughs) And people got very mad at me because I had – at the top of Mahomes Mountain is, shockingly, Patrick Mahomes. The second level was Joe Burrow and the prince who was promised, Trevor Lawrence. And then on the third level was Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, and sandwiched in between them was Caleb Williams. (laughs) And people said, Nick is ridiculous. He's a college player. What are you doing? It's disrespectful. And I said, yeah, I think that I watch Joe Burrow, and I say, oh, I know who he reminds me of. He reminds me of Tom Brady. I'm not saying he's Tom Brady, but a lot of it reminds me of it. I watch Trevor, and I say, oh, he reminds me of Peyton Manning. I'm not saying he's going to be Peyton Manning. I watch Josh Allen, and people get mad at this, but I stand by it. He reminds me of pre-injury Dante Culpepper. Yes, that's the one I go to. The, it, it, a super high ceiling, a little they reckless. Forgo- they have forgotten. They People forgot how good Dante yes. was. pre. People think I'm being wildly disrespectful to him. Pre-injury Dante Culpepper was unbelievable, a little erratic, Yes, but it, all of it. I watch Caleb Williams, and I say, he reminds me of Patrick Mahomes. I'm not saying he is Patrick Mahomes. How good do you think Caleb Williams is? I think the ceiling is incredibly high. The trick bag, of course, is we've seen them Lincoln Riley dudes be so good in college and then somewhat mixed results in the NFL. But, oh, no, 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 no. You know, back when I used to root for Texas in football a little bit. Well, that's the first game of his career. Yes, that's, that was exactly what I was about to say. Go yeah, ahead. He just brought him off the bench. And then it was just like, oh, fellas, don't worry. We got this one. 28-7 <laughs> to 7, Texas in the Red River shootout. Caleb Williams comes in off the bench, and they win the game like 58-55 yes. or something. In yes. No, no, no. This is – that's the number one pick next year. I don't know who else it is that, you know, you could talk about Drake May or all these other dudes. No, 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 no. That guy right there is the number one pick, and that guy is franchise player personality. It is all of those things. Like, when I saw you put him on the pyramid like that, I'm like, oh, no, you're not wrong. Like, they lost that – who did they play? Was it Tulane that they lost that ball game to? They played the ball game against Tulane. somebody they weren't supposed to play. Yeah, they lost, but it wasn't about him. No, and they they lost to Utah during the regular season. Then in the Pac-12 championship game, he's injured and damn near leads him to a victory. Uh, our you know fearless leader Gabe Goodwin's here from LA. He's a USC guy. I listen. I do not pretend to be a college football expert. One of the the here like I try to just be always honest with the audience. There is there is a divide. I, between the guys in our field, married with kids and not. Yes. And the married with kids guy, the divide comes in during football season, which is essentially, are you going to be, you have a choice. You can be an expert on the NFL and the NBA. I'm sorry, the NFL and college football and not really be married that much. That's what I was about to say, are you married? Or <laughs> you can be an expert on one of them. And stay married. Yes. But the whole idea of, hey, honey, from September through February, I am unavailable for 12 hours a day, (laughs) Saturday and Sunday, it's just not going to fly. And so I have sacrificed. I shouldn't even say sacrifice. I just, I am not locked in every, you know, 12 hours of college football. However, I I try to, you know, I obviously watch it. And the West Coast games are the ones that are the easiest to watch because they're on late. And I watch the biggest games. So I remember watching the Red River shootout. And that was was that when Spencer Rattler yes. was their quarterback and yes. he was supposed to be great? And they're getting rolled. And I'm thinking of Bomani because I don't know why Bomani says he's not a Texas fan anymore. He loves that Texas. damn song. It's the only it's that damn song. Oh, okay. The song. Like, like the problem with it is when they do well, the problem is blared through the speaker. All right, that's fair. I, it's a, I, I didn't realize. I thought it was more like a Atlanta Falcons thing. No, nah, no, nah, nah. Because of that. This is on, like, uh, you're a conscientious objective. Yes. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, but I remember watching that game and then seeing this kid come off the bench. I was like, he is unbelievable. And then he gets to USC and is just so clearly better than everybody. Do you think he can win back-to-back Heismans? Yes, it's just going to require USC to go something like eleven and one. I why can't they go twelve and zero? 
Because, I'm not saying that win the national championship. That's yeah. a different story. But I don't know why they don't go 12-0. and 0. Because Lincoln, Riley, and defense, uh-huh. they're not necessarily the most complimentary concepts, right? Like, that was what the holdup was last year, was yep. whether or not they could play enough defense. But in terms of being that guy, oh, man, he is the best quarterback in USC history. I feel confident saying that already. Uh, oh, wow. I mean, you won't be able to think of somebody that's close. Like, hindsight on Matt Leinart. Watch me hand the ball to Reggie Bush. <laughs> yeah. Right? Look how good I am. Um, all right. One other thing on him. I don't believe pro sports are rigged. I don't believe the fix is in. I think there's too much money. I think people that are like, oh, the games are rigged, whatever, um, don't understand really how gambling works Correct. and stuff like that. I do believe this. The NFL needs to put their finger on the scale. Get somebody to the NFC. And make sure <laughs> Caleb Williams is in the NFC. Because if the damn Raiders bottom out and he ends up in the AFC West, or they have to do realignment. They have to do a quarterback-based realignment. But they didn't do this for this reason. People forget Tom Brady's rookie year when he wasn't playing. You know who won the AFC East that year? The Indianapolis Colts, yep. because they were in the division. And the, 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 the Colts and Patriots would have been in the same division forever, and then they did realignment. That's also one of my favorite stats, is that the Indianapolis Colts have won the AFC East more recently than the New York Jets. Yes. Well, even though they don't play in the AFC East. Which is why, sidebar to the take, teams whose fans should be most excited about the next 10 years. Number one draft pick, the Kansas City Chiefs. Number two draft pick might be the Arizona Cardinals. They have they're going to be terrible. They have their pick. Both of the Texans. They, got they the have Texans the Texans pick. pick. They also have whatever pick they get for trading Kyler yes. after they draft Caleb. Yes. It's either going to they're going to go 1 in 16, draft Caleb, have the Texans pick, which they might be able to use on Marvin Harrison Jr. and then trade Kyler for like the 12th pick and do whatever they want. So, all right, so we're on the same page there. But th- but this is what's funny about what you mentioned that, though, needing to go to the NFC. There's a counterpoint on this that since all those quarterbacks are in the AFC, it makes it more likely that the terrible teams are going to be also from the AFC. I know. Because they're playing the murderers. I know. It's an endless cycle. They, they're going to have to figure it out. All right, this this we I told them this would be an hour. We're an oh, hour 15. Good. good. I ain't got no job. Okay. <laughs> all right, we'll take a quick break. Answer your questions from YouTube next. What's right? All right, welcome back in. What's driving the right episode 172, answering your viewer questions now, me and Bomani Jones. Anastasios Markopoulos asks, Nick, what topic do you and Bomani most strongly disagree on? It's hard now that this Jokic thing has been settled. I think it's probably Luka now. I don't even think we disagree that much. Well, it was Jokic yeah, and Bomani yeah, won the argument. We only disagree so much just because you have already built a statue of him in Springfield. Not simply a plaque, not simply a bust in Springfield. Four-time first-team All-NBA. But the statue lit- in front of the whole he Literally, He's literally already a Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I, second most all-time playoff points per game seems good. Four yeah. First, he, has, yeah. he has as many first-team All-NBAs as Steph Curry. It's just us. I mean, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's it. That's um, it. We've, we've gotten to the bottom of yeah, it. Yeah, that, that's it. But that, I think he's a very good player. Like, I have to be careful when I talk to you about him because I don't want it to go too far and people misunderstand it. I'll tell you this. This is what I think about Luka. If you tell me, hey, one guy on a team and you ain't got nothing else, he's my number one draft pick. That's, yeah. Yeah. The, the, I'd like to see him play with great players and see what he does. But we'll, we don't have, the, that's the answer. I don't want to actually. Yeah, we had a white James Harden before. You know what I'm saying? So I want to get a look at it. Here's the thing, though. Let me say this James Harden's game works. The problem is he melts down in the playoffs. Luca gets better in the playoffs. So if you and people are like, oh, it didn't work for James Harden because you weren't getting James Harden in the playoffs. Luca averages 32, nine and nine in the playoffs. Um, all right, for Bomani, who's the biggest threat to USC and why is it Washington? That's from Jeremy Wayne Scott. I mean, the answer why is Washington is Michael Penix, right? Like, like they they got the other like that quarterback guy that's up there. But as I don't pay that much attention to the pack. Four. Question mark, question mark, yeah. question mark. Like the, the pack, the pack number need to be like a slot machine joint. They just <laughs> run all the time. Dan, uh, Dan Lanning is 
keeping up with Cristobal was doing in recruiting at Oregon. And I don't know how they keep getting players to go there. Like, that Nike stuff just must be incredible. Yeah. But that's where I look. And then there's always Utah because Kyle Whittingham is quietly a Hall of Fame coach. Uh, Devontae Mason says, who do you think wins the national championship this year? Georgia. Three-peat? Because why not? Like, the only thing about Georgia is, once again, another quarterback with two last names, Carson Beck. Yeah. They, like, Holly Edison Spencer always make this point. If, you're, if your first name can't be a last name, you can't play quarterback <laughs> at Georgia. But I just can't figure out, and somebody's got to explain this to me, how exactly this happens. Because there's not like there's doing anything schematically that's so far ahead of the rest of the world. They just keep rattling off boys in a way that even Alabama's not doing. Do you, do you think those guys are going – because Alabama, this is one knock on Alabama. It's just the reality of it. Their great defensive players didn't turn typically into great pros. Right. Do you see something similar happening with Georgia? Yeah, I think that, I think that happens with just about everybody because great defensive players are really so difficult to get. But like by comparison, in the last we'll call it twenty years, Pitt has produced Aaron Donald and Darrell Rivas. Uh, and I don't think you can say that about Alabama. Like, Sertan is turning into that dude, yep. or it looks like. But it is very interesting, though, when you look back at these college machines. Outside of Miami, when you really look for, okay, so who were the great pros? It doesn't really turn out that no. way. It's a, it's a depth game. It was, Which is why I still think that either, whether it was 2000 or 2001, Miami is the greatest college team ever. I know it's actually not the greatest college team ever, mm -hmm. but it was the greatest collection of talent of any team in co college football history. Um. Donnie Allen has a hot take that there's never been a great quarterback that's bald or balding, and Trey Lance is balding. What are your thoughts? I got to investigate that. I've never thought of it. It's, I'm just going to make the point that that feels like it's more about than just quarterbacks and that you're speaking on a whole like, demographic of people. <laughs> Fuck you. Oh, hey. I, whoever, whoever that was his name. Oh, what was his name? Devontae? He said Donnie. It's Donnie, Donnie Allen. Yeah, Donnie I, Allen. I, hold on. Right, we, we, I don't we, think he meant shit. Oh. Okay, I see what you're saying. Bomani is Bomani, you had hair. We great out here in these streets. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? We out here we out here making things happen. Ain't been no ain't been no great quarterback. You know what ain't been no great quarterback? Honestly, it's cause they spent so much time keeping the black man out. And this is important because the ultimate example of white privilege is the white man ain't never gotta cut his hair off just cause he bald and right. He can come out here looking like uh looking look, looking like a wizard or a genie or some other shit. You can always get to do that, man. Brother always gotta do that. And by the way, it's not the white man's fault. It be your own people. They the ones that wind up clowning you. But as we start allowing for more black people to be out here, you're gonna wind up with more black bald people, because we can do this a little bit more easily, and then you gonna see. Damn it. He's trying, he trying to say redheads is better than us. <laughs> and it's only been one of them. Sonny Jurgensen is the only one I can think of. What about Andy Dalton? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Today's show, What's Right, episode 172. Subscribe to the right time with Bamani Jones back on your RSS feed shortly. Bo, I love you. Yo, this, by the way, is why I don't need to do a YouTube show, because they always like, oh, you got to acknowledge people's questions. That's how I acknowledge people's questions. Right there. I'm not, I'm not nice enough for real-time feedback. <laughs> See you guys later. Hey, it's Nick Wright. Thank you so much for watching. Please do us a favor. Click subscribe. It helps my ego. And demonze has got a financial bonus writing on a number of YouTube subscribers. So help him out. And also, click the bell. I don't know what the bell does, but they tell me to tell you to click the bell. And your audio listeners, people that have commutes, drives, whatever it is, subscribe to the podcast as well, wherever you get the podcast. Same show, just, you know, just in your ears instead of through your eyes. All that. Check it out. Appreciate y'all.